This is great. But I like this. Boomer shooters. You gotta know them, you gotta love them. What Wolfenstein, Doom, Quake, and their lineage of fast-paced first-person shooters have done for the gaming industry and gaming as a medium is unfathomable. Many players' first immersive experience in a 3D world stemmed from one of these games. Not to mention the first times people hooked up their machines to a network and could play with or against other actual people. We take these things for granted now and it almost seems silly to dwell on such commodity features as networking or 3D rendering. But no matter how advanced modern games get, there will always be something about the pure simplicity of these games that makes me and many others come back to these classics in celebration and keeping them alive on modern hardware. This is an amazing achievement of these communities, and truly commendable. But there's just something not quite right. Is there? Let's face it, playing an NES game with an Xbox controller on an emulator works, but it's not the intended experience. This holds true for many classic games and systems, but with me being partial to retro FPS games in particular, I wanted to have the possibility of enjoying these games in a more suitably retro fashion. The easy answer here would be to scour eBay for a PC of a certain time frame that could play the classic games I'm looking to enjoy authentically. However, there are two problems with this. Number one, Old PCs are going for a fortune now. Even something like a Pentium 2 can go for a pretty penny these days, not to mention the abhorrent prices that 486 and lower IBM compatibles sell for these days. And number two? I don't just want to experience old games. Over the last decade or so, we've seen a much welcome shift in the FPS genre going from the brown and grey FPS monotony of the 2000s into the more self-aware and self-celebratory nature of many 2010s FPSs. While this trend was in full swing even in AAA studios, the indie underground was bubbling with retro-themed FPS games that seek to recreate the endearingly chunky visuals and oddball abstract design choices that this genre used to be synonymous with. Dusk a medieval, Ion Fury, and many others have shown the merit, relevance, and pure fun in the design principles behind these old shooters. Now, the task of building a PC that can give a feeling of retro authenticity to the true classics and their modern admirers alike is no easy feat, so let's split this up, shall we? Number 1. The Components Starting with the backbone of any computer, we have the motherboard. I picked up an ASRock J3355B ITX. This little board is made for low power PCs with low heat output and boasts many integrated components, including the CPU. The Intel J3355 is a dual core CPU at 2.5 GHz built for passive cooling in embedded systems. This, paired with 4GB of DDR3 RAM, SODIMM modules in this case, builds a great base for older games and low-spec modern ones. However, for some of the newer games, no dedicated graphics at all can severely hinder performance. Luckily, I have this tiny AMD RX 460 card laying around, with 2GB of VRAM and a fairly low clock speed, this card won't perform any wonders, but it will do very well for the games I intend to play here. Powering this machine is a 300W PSU from Be Quiet, in the SFX form factor to be precise. 
And finally, we have some small fans and a spare 120GB SSD. Now, I kept alluding to the size of many of these components, and I did for a good reason. The case I intend to build these components into is this tiny desktop case for point-of-sale deployment. I came across it on the German equivalent to Craigslist and found it too neat to pass up. Cramming this small but decently capable set of hardware into this absolutely tiny footprint is quite the task. On first glance it even seems impossible, but with a PCIe riser cable the GPU will be mounted horizontally alongside some other needed modifications to the GPU, PSU and chassis. But before embarking on the build, I hooked everything up and tested each component thoroughly, while also checking the temperatures from a Manjaro live environment. After determining that everything was in working order, I packed up and moved to the workshop. Number 2. The build. After organizing all the parts, I decided to start by modifying the GPU. While small, the two-slot design and the card's bulky cooler made it impossible to mount the PSU alongside it. I began by disassembling it and marking all needed cuts to convert the card into a one-slot design. With the individual pieces in hand, I first cut off the lower half of the GPU bracket and certain areas of the heatsink fins for clearance. After dusting off the GPU's PCB, I tightly wrapped it in anti-static foil and proceeded to cut off the DVI port, with as much grace as angle grinders can provide. After pulling the remaining pins and giving the whole board a cleaning with nail polish remover and compressed air, it was time to repaste and reassemble. Setting the monitor back up, I was relieved to see the card still in working order. However, this GPU is still designed for active airflow, something the bulky fan cannot provide here. To remedy this, I used these tiny 40mm fans in conjunction. One would pull fresh air from the case's side vent over the GPU fins, while the other would push it out of the chassis rear. Moving on from the GPU, it was time to wrangle with the case itself. I began by taking a few general measurements of the case's interior and started marking certain areas for modification. Namely the screw mount for the GPU, holes for the power supply switch and connector, and part of the front shield for clearance. Once marked I began using the tools at my disposal to make the necessary changes. I used a standing drill for the GPU hole and my trusty Dremel for the additional openings. The Dremel also came in useful when cutting off the unnecessary molded standoffs this case came with, as well as trimming some of the plastic on the front faceplate. After sanding down all sharp edges and cleaning the dust from the case, I covered all the exposed bits of metal left over from the standoffs with electrical tape. For cleanliness and future-proofing, I also cut up some of these cheap mesh fan filters, which I then used on the side intake vents and later for the bay covers. On that topic, the airflow of the system will inevitably be less than desirable. To relieve some of this issue, I created bay covers out of some plastic sheets, drilled them with a large bit and installed some mesh behind them. All parts of the front panel then also got a coat of grey primer and some matte clear coating, resulting in a more uniform look. With the case now modded and prepared, I had to move on to the one step I was truly dreading in this project. The PSU. You see, even with the thorough mods to the GPU and case for clearance, the PSU was only going to fit without its protective outer casing. On top of that, it would still ever so slightly overlap with the motherboard and require some of its high voltage cables to be extended. The first step was obviously to disassemble the units, which proved more tricky than you'd think. No PSU manufacturer ever expects these things to be taken apart, so it takes some elbow grease to pop the connector and switch out of the shell before the casing can be removed. 
After cutting off the power and switch cables for a later extension, I cut off all unneeded internal power connectors for both space and airflow concerns before isolating each wire with some heat shrink. Focusing on the connector and switch, I pressure mounted them in their new intended positions and cut out a small plastic bracket holding them in place more securely. Once the ideal position of the connectors and the PSU itself were found, I sanded down some typical PC standoffs and glued them in place for the PSU to mount to. After isolating the bottom of the PSU's PCB, I screwed it into the standoffs and carefully observed the contraption from all sides, making sure nothing was rubbing on anything that it shouldn't. Finally, I connected yet another 40mm fan, this time to the fan header of the PSU for more airflow, as well as bridging the extended power cables with a clamp and ample amounts of heat shrink. Now, to finish up the build, it was just a matter of putting things together correctly. After mounting the motherboard and PSU in their final positions, I attached the connected GPU fans to the side and back of the case. Before installing the GPU, I cut some screws to the rough height of the case's internals and covered them in heat shrink. I made these just as a safety measure to prevent the GPU from sagging onto the exposed PSU and providing overall rigidity for the top panel. With that all said and done, the only thing left was to carefully bend the PCI Express riser cable, isolating the back of the GPU, and finally mounting everything in its place. And voila, it lives. Somehow. Even with the top panel on, it continued working as intended and did not overheat, even after a few hours of monitored usage. This has probably been my most reprehensible PC build ever. I need to reiterate that you should do as I say, not as I do. Uh, this was a stupidly dangerous idea, all things considered, but it does work. Number 3 Peripherals. Kicking down a gear, let's look at the peripherals I bought to use with the system. This is honestly where most of the retro charm and aesthetics come from. I picked out some items that, given their feature set and looks, fit suitably to a store-bought PC from roughly 1995 to 1996. Starting with the keyboard, I found this old IBM board on eBay for a good price. It's obviously not a Model M and uses fairly scratchy rubber domes, so curb your excitement. The mouse I picked up new for literally 2 euros. It's a simple 2 button ball mouse by Logitech. Mind you, scroll wheels or 3 button mice were not as common around 96 as you would think. This is again a typical mouse for a budget system. But a 90s ball mouse obviously needs a mouse pad to function reliably and not gunk up the internal rollers all the time. So I paid 6 bucks to get the Windows 95 setup wallpaper printed on this little pad right here. Don't ask me why I thought this was necessary, but here we are. The speakers arrived quite late, so I couldn't showcase them in full here, but they happen to be power speakers by H&H. &H. Yeah, generic as all hell, which is perfectly fine. But clearly the most important peripheral that sets the experience of using a retro PC apart from modern ones is the monitor. This delightful 14-inch CRT by Bellinea blessed my retinas when I saw it for pickup online not too far from me, so I had to get it. With decent resolution support and a lovely chunky look, this little guy seemed like the perfect match for my tiny retro PC until you realize just how fucking puny the system is. I've literally never seen a smaller PC CRT, at least in the flesh, and it still looks comically large to our <clears throat> engineering marvel. 
I was honestly quite happy with the overall look and really felt like the project was coming together much more smoothly than expected. For the hardware, that was indeed true, but the next step sent me on a bit of a wild goose chase. Number 4. Software The software used on a system like this will make or break the experience. Even with all aesthetics in mind, my first step was to install Windows 10. Obviously, Windows 10 was not the right choice here. However, Windows 7 was not officially supported on the motherboard used. The installer would hang, not recognize drives, or refuse to load altogether. Even after manually adding the EFI drivers to the boot medium, Installing Windows 7 onto the SSD via my ThinkPad as a donor PC and even flashing a virtual disk image of a Windows 7 installation onto the SSD, there was just no luck to be had. So, I did what I think we all should do even on our daily systems. Give Linux a try! I've been messing with various distributions of Linux for close to 10 years and have used it as a daily driver at many points, so I was sure that my old pal Arch Linux would install in a breeze. A breeze of manual command line busy work, but such is life on Arch. But there came yet another unexpected monkey wrench. Even after multiple flashings, the live Arch medium refused to either see or access the SSD. Manjaro was next on the platter, but I had low hopes as it is based on Arch and thereby possibly susceptible to the same problem on this hardware. Lo and behold, I was correct. After grumbling to myself for a bit, I decided there was one distro so dead set stable that it had to get me somewhere. Debian, your friendly neighborhood distro, not minimal and cool like Arch, not bloated and overly simplified like Ubuntu, just an OG doing its thing, and its thing it did do. Installation went without a hitch and soon I was locked into an XFCE session, my favorite floating style desktop environment. But as it always does, something about Linux just tickles that fancy dictating me to customize the ever-loving crap out of everything. Luckily, I would barely need to do anything myself, thanks to the Chicago95 project on GitHub. Chicago was the codename for Windows 95 when it was still in development at Microsoft. After cloning the Chicago 95 repo and simply executing the installer script, almost everything was fully automated. The few steps for even more authenticity were neatly outlined on the project page as well, which I followed as close as possible. The result was breathtaking. The attention to detail from the taskbar, the window title bar, the icons, even the seldomly spotted yellow pop-up message is spot on. It would honestly be difficult to pick this one out when lined up with real Windows 95 screenshots. The road here was weird and shaky, but now the sleeper retro aesthetic of the hardware is mirrored on the software side as well. From here, it was just a case of making a few additional tweaks, installing some needed software like Wine for Windows programs, and pulling all my retro FPS games from my home NAS. Now, there's only one sweet thing left to do. The experience of actually playing games on this machine really starts when turning it on. The CRT sizzling in an old school XDM login manager really sell the retro flair and just puts me in that weird state of giddiness that I associate with my first PC I had back in the day. From the desktop, it's just a matter of selecting the installed game. For many classics, source ports are available, but running, say, Doom in DOSBox on the original resolution really transforms this from a random skinned Linux box into something much more substantial and accurate feeling. Than I expected. 
The new retro FPS games for Windows, like Ion Fury and Wrath Aeon of Ruin, run perfectly under Wine with no stuttering whatsoever, while being only borderline playable on Windows 10. Older ports like the Steam version of Turok 2 or System Shock 2 work like a charm as well. After finishing the filming for this part, I found myself turning back around in my computer chair and playing Ion Fury and Doom for a good few hours. I could have just as well played them on one of my 27-inch monitors while listening to music or watching a video on the other one, but something about the glow of a small CRT in a dark room just hooked me in a way that I missed for a long time. For the conclusion, was this a dumb idea? Yes. I I yes. Was it a fun project? Nerve-wracking, but definitely yes. And was it worth it? Again, yes. Authenticity in retro gaming is a weird beast. Some might be purists who will cast the first stone upon me for not buying a 486-based machine, while some will outright call me a poser for hooking up a CRT to what is basically a modern machine, but to me, the result is undeniably beautiful, in a clunky way. Being able to enjoy some of my favorites much closer to how they were intended to be experienced, at least aesthetically, really gives me some more perspective on just how impressive these games must have been in their heyday. Additionally, the fact that new games are coming out, which I will be able to enjoy, in an almost alternate reality style by pretending these are actual games that came out in, say, 1996, will increase my enjoyment of these titles even more. Whichever way you slice it, this was a weird old ride of a project. And if you remotely enjoyed my ill-advised shenanigans, then please feel free to subscribe. Like and follow my Twitter for more updates, posts and videos just as wacky, weird and dumb as this one. Take care and have a good one.